much for the invitation. Uh, I'm and Chiara to be here. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, the work I'll talk about is uh, uh, in the direction the, together with uh, Benoit Pazadeh and tries to somehow take the techniques that are known for this quantum many body or uh, the many body limit of quantum systems and transfer them a little bit to the study of these classical Blas of Poisson systems. Okay? And uh, uh, yes. I hope you can read everything here. I'm a little bit out of practice with the talk after all of this, so please let me know. The whole talk will be more of an informal sketch of everything, and I don't have, I, I think I, I cannot be exhausted with all the references, so if there's something in particular that you'd like to more, know more about, I'd be happy to give you more details. Clearly, there's many parallels with work that exists, right? So I'm not saying I reinvented the work here, okay? All right, good. So the object that we study is a distribution function defined on the phase space. So here I have two variables, x and v, which are both going to be in R3. And this distribution function, here you can think of as having arisen from many body limit in a quantum setting, with a classical limit, for example, it satisfies this blasov poisson equation. So it's a transport equation that you can see is at the level of characteristics is just transport by, like you would have, of a classical particle in a potential field, right? So that the derivative of x in time would be v, the derivative of v in time would be the gradient of this potential. And what makes this a nonlinear problem now is that this potential is self-generated by the distribution itself. So you integrate the distribution over all the velocities, you get the density, you solve a Poisson problem, and this is the field that is created. Okay? And in general, it's worth distinguishing also the sign of this, of this potential, whether it's attractive, in this case minus one, or repulsive. And this whole system can also be written in a Hamiltonian perspective, right? So we can write this as a Hamiltonian system, maybe not so surprising given where this comes from. And we have a Hamiltonian that is simply a kinetic part plus this potential. Okay? Good. So the question that uh, I'm going to be interested in is the question of asymptotic behavior. So how do solutions to this system behave? And in general, uh, the answer is just unknown. There's not much to be said. There's, of course, a lot of work. So the things that are known are, is that solutions to this system are, in general, globally well posed, so for reasonably nice initial data, smooth, uh, and so on. You get global solutions, so there's no problem with studying asymptotics in the sense that you could have blow up or so, right? And this is a work that goes back to Leon Spatan, Fafelmosa, Schaeffer, and has been revisited and reused in many different fashions. There's also the study uh, of existence and orbitable stability of bound states. So if you have an attractive setting, then you, you can see this like a, this sort of a focusing mechanism that can create bound states. <coughs> this is a study that also started very early with, say, work of genes in the galactic setting. And then I think the recent names to say are Guo, Rhein, and then Le Moumet and Raphael, which are sort of closer to what we've been doing. But the work here is sort of an proceeds from a variational perspective, so how you construct these bound states and then how you characterize them as a variational thing. So in particular, there's barely any information about actual asymptotic dynamics in the nonlinear problem, right? So what I'm listing here is really somehow everything that's known in the very specific setting where you really have just this equation, so just the Coulomb, just the Coulomb potential here, and really the nonlinear problem, right? So there's more, much, much more work if you have a different kind of potential here or if you're, just look, if you're looking at linear stability results. But in the non-linear setting, there's really three results I can think of. Uh, one is the behavior near vacuum, so if you have small dilute gases, and it started with work of Bartos de Gond, and there have been lots of works trying to understand the sharp decay rates. And the, the picture was really only completed recently uh, by myself and Opasada and various other people. So this is what I'll talk about. Then there's the more famous work of lambda damping on Tori. This is a slightly different setting because the mechanism here, uh, the, the mechanism for, let's say, stability is a little different because you're on a torus. The last work I should mention is a uh, work of myself with Bruno Pausada, which studies a point charge in a radial setting. So you can think of this as uh, an atom surrounded by a cloud of molecules or the sun surrounded by an asteroid, or just yeah, the convergence of some of these many body systems when one of your bodies didn't get the memo that it should converge to something smooth, okay? Okay, so when, we, when I talk about asymptotic stability here, then the thing I should mention is, of course, what is the mechanism of stability, right? So the mechanism of stability in the setting on R3 is dispersion. 
So if you have some initial distribution that's sufficiently smooth, then it will tend to spread out and the density will tend to get diluted. Okay, and to see this, maybe the thing to start is to consider this a solution to the associated linear problem, right? So consider a linear solution. So dt of g plus v grad x of g is equal to zero. So no self-interaction with a non-linear thing. Then you can write down the solution, right? So then the solution g of x, v and p is just going to be the initial data traveling along the characteristics of this transport problem. And that's it, right? So how does this lead to decay? But if you look at the level of the spatial density, so the function that, that looks at how much of your distribution sits at some point of space, then this, well, it's just the V integral of your solution, right? So it's going to be the integral of G0 of x minus Vt, V, dV. And here I can change variables and get that this is, so <laughs> if we have A in this variable here, this is going to be decaying with a factor t to the minus 3. It's just a Jacobian of this change of variables if I control this, right? So I could write this as saying, well, my density rho of x and t is t to the minus 3 the integral of my initial data evaluated at x over t dA plus some lower order terms, OK? So all of this computation, of course, assumes that your g0 is sufficiently smooth that you can make sense of this change of variables and so on, right? So it wouldn't work for a point mass or something very singular. But so this tells you that the density decays, right? So what would be a, a reasonable guess would be to say, well, if you solve this nonlinear problem just for very small things, so something very close to vacuum, this should happen as well, right? So the guess would be to say that f of x and v and t could asymptotically just behave like some function that solves the linear problem, so it's in g infinity, that is traveling according to the linear characteristics, right? So this would be s e goes to infinity if f solves this Blas of Poisson problem for initial data that are somehow small, right? So sufficiently small initial data. Right? So this, you, you could say, would be a natural guess, because somehow you're just looking at a minor perturbation of this linear problem in some sense, right? And it turns out that this is false. Okay, so even in the simplest case of the vacuum, this is false. In, I should say false in general. It can still be true for, let's say, the Landau damping, it's slightly different setting, right? But in, this, in the simplest setting of the vacuum, this is false. And the reason is essentially that you have long-range effects from your Coulomb potential. And as we will see, these long-range effects, they create a nonlinear cor correction to this dynamic here. Okay. Now, the sort of the methodology that I'll uh, that I'll use here is well, to understand this question. To actually understand this behavior is this uh, briefly mentioned idea of transferring some techniques from the quantum setting, from the world of dispersive PDE, to this setting. Right. So, idea. Right. Is the attractive and repulsive case of the same thing? Yes, because for small data, this doesn't matter. It's a little unsatisfactory for large data in general, but even the local, even the global web process results do not distinguish between attractive and repulsive case. So, so the picture is very partial still. So the method here is uh, somehow to try to use dispersive or Hamiltonian PDE techniques in the study of this problem, which is, I think, uh, traditionally been more viewed as a transport problem and uh, just approached with the corresponding techniques. And something that is very uh, simple but turns out to be uh, pretty useful is to, instead of working with a function f that, let's say, would be a, a non-negative L1 function, it's better to work with an L2 function. 
So from an analytic perspective, I think this is, if you think of your density, you will think of it as a function u squared. This is very natural in the sense that you get to work with L2 functions. So for example, they're further away from delta functions. And this really enables an L2-based functional setting, right? So L2 setting, and this enables right, these kind of energy estimates and so on. Okay, so this enables these whole Hamiltonian PD techniques. It's also not so unnatural if you think that somehow a non-negative function f, if it's smooth enough, would have some implicit conditions. Like if the function is zero, then its derivative has to vanish as well. This is automatically encoded if you write it like this, for example, right? Okay, so now what can we show with this? The result that we can show is uh, has two parts, A and B, which are joined with uh, Alex Inescu and Xue Cheng Wang in one part, and then also with Patrick Flynn and Jimmy Ouyang. Two works from last year and this year. And the first part really concerns this nonlinear correction that I was talking about, right? So this so-called modified scattering. And the, the way to say this is you have to start with initial data, which have some localization and some smoothness, here expressed in terms of Sobolev norms. And I write this a little informally, less than epsilon, meaning there's an epsilon suffi sufficiently small such that this holds. So then you get a unique global solution. This is not surprising. This, this is already somehow part of the general web closeness. But what you can say is that this so-called thing that we call the scattering mass, so the integration of your density in the space, not the velocity. This is an object that converges. And this mass will create, like the density does, some electric field, such that when you look at the dynamics, as time goes to infinity, you don't just see the linear evolution, which would be this part, so this would be the shift from the linear transport, but you see a logarithmic correction due to this, as in, to this field, right? So this is the nonlinear correction. This is why it's called modified scattering. If you didn't have it, you would just call it scattering. Okay. So this is the nonlinear correction due to the long-range effects. The scattering mass, you can think of it as, you can think of it as the mass that travels in a certain direction, v, right? So asymptotically, it matters in which direction your mass is sort of accumulated. This uh, generates the electric field, which then gives you the correction. Linear behavior, okay? Um, the second part of this statement says sort of the converse, namely that all these kind of dynamics actually happen, right? So if you have data at infinity, satisfying again some regularity assumptions, then you get a unique global solution to the Vlasov Poisson system that satisfies this modified scattering behavior. So you can see this. It's not important to take small data at infinity here because you sort of prescribe the dynamics, right? So this is a different problem. So let me draw a quick picture of this. So you can think that somehow you have a solution here that starts at some initial time, and then it does some stuff that is, the, is due to the, the nonlinear effects. And the long range, there's some asymptotic state. So there's some asymptotic state at time plus infinity that this tends to the solution. Right? So the first statement says, OK, if you have initial data, you get to some correction, and we can precisely characterize what this correction is. And the other theorem says that also, wherever, however you want to start at infinity, you can go backwards in time, right? Now, because this whole problem is Hamiltonian form is time reversible, you can also just reverse the order of this thing, right? So you might as well start with something that comes at a time minus infinity from some direction and does some things and then goes to plus infinity along this modified scattering characteristic, right? And this is what would be called the scattering map, which takes data at negative time infinity to data at positive time infinity. Okay, so this is, the, this is sort of the picture of what happens here. Okay, now the, the methods to, to prove this I will only briefly sketch. The, the method one is sort of, uh, I would say, is maybe the, the classic dispersive method. Make some space here. So the classic dispersive method something that has been, I mean, developed in, in many works in the dispersive setting. 
So this is the method that we used for A, sort of, yeah, I think, <coughs> close predecessors in the works of modified scattering in NLS or yeah, so on, on various domains. And this basically consists in trying to really control the decay that you have in the system and then using the decay, propagating all the information you need. Okay? So basically, this problem is, uh, some, the decay in this problem is critical in the sense that it gives you just this, this correction that fails to, this logarithmic correction that just fails to be an integral correction, right? So if you had a little bit more decay, you would integrate something that decays slightly faster, and instead of a logarithmic correction, you would just a finite correction, and this would not matter at all, right? So this is a critical problem, so what you have to really do is you have to understand the decay. And to, re to get this decay, the idea is to get, or to understand a, Sort of, I, I'll write it as a weak norm, so something that is as weak as possible, that still gives you the full decay of the object. Okay, so, weak norm for sharp decay in this problem, so the sharp dispersion. As a second step, then you would use the sharp decay to get stronger control. So, first you would, you would get the convergence of this relatively weak norm, so you obtain something that is really the sharp decay, and then you control stronger norms that make sure you can you have enough derivative moments and so on to make sense of your solution. And the last step would be, well, once you have a lot of information about your system, you can hope to identify the asymptotic dynamics and prove that actually you get this conversion that's written down as the star. Okay. This is, a, this is a fairly robust method. It's not somehow a tool that works with all kinds of equations. It's really something that's specific for each equation. You have to understand what are the quantities that control the decay. Once you have this, you can try to build a, this kind of hierarchy. Usually, the, the, or because this problem is quasi-linear, the asymptotic dynamics and the convergence in particular get in a, in a slightly weaker norm than this strong norm here, right? So you use now, I should clarify what is the weak norm in the setting. It's sort of already visible here, right? If you want to get the decay, you have to control this kind of object. And this is exactly what corresponds to our scattering mass. Right? So this is an integral, in this case, over the x variable, where the v variable you leave outside. This is the object that converges. And this is what will also give you the precise decay rate. OK? So, so much for sort of a general, uh, relatively robust approach. What I want to describe is something that is, in general, is maybe less flexible, but is very powerful in the setting and also has a very close uh, quantum analog. And that's the uh, pseudo conformal transformation. So the pseudo-conformal transformation is a mapping of the x, v, and t space to the new variable x over t, x minus v, t, and 1 over t. Okay? And from now on, I'll call these things q, v, okay? And this mapping has a few nice properties. For example, <laughs> It's almost uh, symplectic, so we compute in these two variables dx over dv, it's minus dq dv, and it preserves solution to the linear transport. So if tau is the operator of the linear transport operator, then you can see that uh, the linear transport of something composed with this pseudo-conformal inversion given by, again, a rescaling of the transport of your function composed of the pseudo-conformal. Okay? Now, okay, this is all very nice. It preserves the mass and so on. So this, is, this has nice properties for the linear problem. And for the nonlinear problem, it's not so bad either. So the nonlinear equation will be an equation for a new variable that I call gamma, which is just the 
all variable transformed by the pseudo-conformal inversion. satisfied by this gamma, well, it's, I call it plus plus one with the prime, this is going to be ds of gamma plus p gradient q of gamma, so far not so surprising, this is just the analog of the transport, and now you have a component that has a very singular term, namely the S inverse, where I used, uh, I used this sort of plasma terminology that E of Q is just this gradient of my potential in these variables, okay? So I think of this as the electronic electric field. I think of it as a gravitational field. This is just terminology, right? We have this equation, and the thing is that this is now an equation on the time, in, the time interval from, let's say, zero up to one, right? So if I want to study this problem, so this is on a line, zero, one, the original Vlasov Poisson problem, I could have said it's say for convenience it's starting time one, so everything is well defined here. I study this Vlasov Poisson problem on the time interval from one to infinity, and this corresponds to studying the transform problem on this compact time interval from zero to one. Or from, I should say, from one to zero at the time direction is reversed as well. So you see that. The, the general global problem transforms to a local problem with a singular coefficient, right? But the singular coefficient, it really only matches when you get close to zero. So this, this equation is uh, very well suited for traditional dispersive PDE technology. You have a transport, so to speak, by divergence-free vector field, so you, have, you can propagate energies and localizations relatively easily. So by PDE methods, You get the uh, well, propagate moments and derivatives and so on. And you will see that they will all grow just very slowly. Everything will grow logarithmically because essentially you're integrating copies of these factors as inverse, right? So you, you know, by the PD methods, you get global solutions. And the interesting thing is that you can show that actually this electric field will converge, okay? So this is a time-dependent thing, maybe I should have written it as something that depends on S and Q, but you get also that this S field converges to some asymptotic field, right? And uh, this you get because you can write down basically a continuity equation. So the S of your electric field will be that's given by the gradient of the reverse Laplace inverse of the current, where the current is some moment of your function. So j is going to be just a moment of your function. Okay? Now, if you think that this will diverge logarithmically as you go to zero, here you get that the time derivative is logarithmic, so in particular you can integrate this to something finite. Right? So this e field will converge, and if you look at the resulting equation, right, so the asymptotic model, will be just the equation of ds of gamma plus p grad q of gamma. It's the e-field by its asymptotic value, and this is just the shear equation, right? So if you integrate the singular terms here, this would exactly give you the log correction, right? So, I hope this is clear, right? So if you look at a 
function that involves a long shifted trajectory, this will converge. Okay. Um, so this is very nice in the super conformal setting because unlike the sort of the general expressive setting, it's very clear how this log arises. Well, this log arises, okay, then it's a little bit of work to prove this convergence, but still you immediately see it coming up here. Okay. Okay, I'm going to finish with a quick remark about the, the proof of, sec of the second part of this, um, the existence of this modified wave operator. And in the setting of the pseudo-conformal transformation, where you compactify your time interval, solving the problem at infinity for the original equation is just starting is solving the problem starting at zero, right? So for pi b, you can think of this as an initial value problem for this transformed equation at time to the zero, right? Now the difficulty is, or the challenge, is that all the norms that you had Four, or many of them diverge, right? All the strong control that you need to make sense of the equation will have logarithmic growth. So in some sense, you cannot start with this infinite data at infinity, right? And uh, if, you, if you look at this model, like you could correct by this asymptotically again, but you would say it's something that is divergent at the initial time, right? So you cannot integrate these things at the same time so easily. So what you do instead is, you use this Hamiltonian structure to integrate the asymptotic dynamics. So I'm running a little short on time, but essentially you can use a generating function arrive at a new Hamiltonian, so you get to a new Hamiltonian, so that your h transforms to something, let's call it k, that is h minus a correction that comes from this generating function, so you get a canonical change of variables to new variables, and in these new variables you have a Hamiltonian, so in variables let's call them alpha and beta, right? and in these new variables you will have a Hamiltonian that instead of having just the kinetic part with a very singular potential, you have something that, uh, that looks at the difference between the data you have, maybe I should call it phi zero because they're given uh, time zero, and the difference of your potential time zero and the, the, at a later time, which you know is something that converges. So this is actually not something that diverges so much, right? So this is something you can control. From this, so you get a change of variables. The, the difficulty in this change of variables is that, in general, this will be an ill-conditioned change of variables. So you'll have something like that is something of this order. So this is ill-conditioned. So what you have to do is you have to recondition your your uh, derivatives, if you want to propagate derivatives here with some weights to make sure that you still uh, you can still uh, propagate information at zero. And this conditioning and the corresponding reconditioning, so you recondition the derivatives and this, uh, this means that in, the, in essence you will lose one moment in your Valpozmus theory. And this is sort of consistent with what we had before, that you don't get convergence in the strongest norm. You have to put some more information than what you get in the dynamics. Okay, sorry for taking all this time. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you. Yes, I'm wondering how this compares with the modified scattering in the quantum case by Gilles Brevelou and company. And if one could guess the form of the modification from the corresponding modification in the Hartree case, in the quantum case. That's possible. Um, I think the, so the, there's a very close parallel in terms of 
modified scattering uh, in let's say NLS, right? Mm -hmm. Where you where this the role of the scattering mass. Right? The scattering mass is essentially the Fourier transform in L infinity in that case. Like for the decay to get the sharp decay in the Schrodinger equation by stationary phase, you basically need to control the Fourier transform point-wise. And this would be the equivalent there. So in I think maybe the, the classic work that parallels this the work of Cato and Pusateri for 1D cubic NLS modified scattering there, where it's exactly you, in the sense, they get an ODE for the equivalent of this object, and then you can, once you control this, you can conclude that actually you have the asymptotic dynamics, like they're stated here. I'm not sure about how exactly the parallels would be in the sense that I, I don't know so much about uh, non Coulomb potentials, so I don't know to what extent this would be the relevant thing to do, but uh, yeah. I'll, I look into this. Okay. Uh, maybe a different question. Uh, what's known in the relativistic case when you replace v squared by the square root of? Uh, I think. I mean, square. <laughs> I think then, then you can even have a finite time blow up. So it's uh, it's a different problem. I I think there's very little known. So I don't. Sorry. For small solutions. I think there might be global uh, existence solutions that is known. I'm not sure that the dynamics are actually known. But don't you have a difference whether you are uh, repulsive or attractive in that case? Uh, probably, yes. So I guess small data matters mm. uh, when you have the attractive one, but for the repulsive one... Uh, mm. uh, in some sense here, it doesn't matter at all. Right? Yeah. And uh, it matters for the existence of bound states. Yeah. I mean, here, and Coulomb is critical with respect to scattering. Yes. But uh, when you look at relativistic, yeah, it's even worse because now. And, uh, there is better existence, I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's too stable. More solutions. As far as I understand, the relevant model would be Blas of Maxwell. Yeah. Dynamics of the. It should have something that is really Lorentz invariant. Mm -hmm. And there, I don't think this is uh, understood. Probably in that case, uh, radial symmetry really play a role in the, even more than, um, so probably you can say something uh, for uh, radially symmetric data in the relativistic. Then maybe if I may something very quick, so that's something you didn't have really have time to explain. So the one over S is really because it's Coulomb. So the phi is which phi? One has to do a change of variable also in the Coulomb. Uh, I mean, the yes, so you, have, you, have, you have an expression that tells you how the e in terms of your uh, of the original variable mu is expressed in terms of gamma, and this is just a rescaling of the space and the factor, the additional the factor. Poisson has this Laplacian that you get exactly the one over i. Yes. So, so if you reach, if you change the potential, then in terms of the new unknown, this will rescale differently, so you would not get this critical. So in the later case, they deal with the Coulomb, with catering the Coulomb, with Coulomb when introducing this modified wave operator, which are called the dollar wave operators or something like that. Do you know something about the comparison of? Sorry? In the linear case, so I'm familiar with the quantum case, but yeah. probably also in the classical case, you can also where you need to modify the wave operator because of the lack of, of decay of the Coulomb potential, and they introduce these dollar wave operators, which are. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure about this because okay. so here in the linear case you really don't have, I mean this is just transport in the linear case, right? But I think so if, you, if you put an external potential which yeah. decays slowly. Yes, so you have a potential. Yes. Yeah, then I mean, presumably there's a, there's a correction for that. I'm not really knowledgeable with this. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, I don't see any, so let's thank Klaus again. <laughs>